That's great. Okay. All right. So since it's 7.01, I'll begin my little presentation for today. I always like to give a context for our dialogue. And uh, the, the subject for Unit 2 in Discover Holism is about duality. And understanding duality, understanding uh, what duality means and then what the perspective of holism on duality is a really important part of understanding what holism is about. So we're going to do a little bit of mind-bending stuff right now and, and look at uh, how we see the world and how we could see the world a little differently. So welcome everyone else. That's oh, good. A number of people are joining us. Hi, Diana. Hey, nice to see you. Great to see you. Okay, and number 105656984, <laughs> wherever you are, I guess you're on your phone, but welcome as well. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen and uh, show you guys a little slideshow so that you can see some pictures and not just watch me talk. And so it makes it a little bit more interesting. And here we go. So everyone should be able to see that now. So Today's talk, actually, for those of you who were here la uh, last week or the week before, uh, I just wanted to make a little connection there, is um, I talked about the, uh, the I Ching uh, and being the most ancient book and the basis of Chinese medicine, because this is a, a book that was written thousands of years ago. Uh, and uh, very often is used and was used by rulers in China to determine the way of the Tao. It's a Taoist book. Uh, and it was how to align yourself with the cosmos, how to align your actions uh, that would be most auspicious as to how you are positioned within the cosmos at, at any given time. So it was a book of reflection and where you ask a question and then the I Ching gives you something to contemplate about your question. And it's quite interesting how, uh, how profound it is and how pertinent it is. Carl Jung wrote extensively about the I Ching, uh, as did a couple of quantum physicists. One important mathematician who knew the I Ching was Leibniz. In the late 1600s, this very famous mathematician actually based a new system of arithmetic on the I Ching. So binary arithmetic, which uses the characters one and zero, are the basis and you know, was, was, was based on the 64 hexagrams of the I Ching. And this is a quote from, from Leibniz. He said, explanation of the binary arithmetic, which uses only the characters one and zero, with some remarks on its usefulness, and on the light it throws on the ancient Chinese figures of Fu Zi. So this was after he had read the I Ching. He then, if you can see, these, these are his notes on the, uh, on the left side. And you can see the hexagrams. You see the first, the top hex, hexagram there. He's just written it in a, in a vertical form instead of the usual horizontal form. But he's showing how each one of these hexagrams can be uh, used to uh, uh, signify a number and realized that actually anything in reality can be represented as a model uh, of, of its binary con constituents. In other words, as ones and zeros. So everything in nature, and of course this is the basis of our computer systems, we would not have uh, computers and we would not have the images that we see on our electronic screens were it not for Leibniz having read the I Ching and created this arithmetic, created this binary system that is now the basis of all computerization. So the Chinese called zero and one yin and yang, the open and closed lines. And they said that yin and yang are the two dimensions of reality. And with these two dimensions, all of reality can be represented. So 
And it's true, as we realize, because all of the virtual videos that you see, virtual reality, the Pokemon game <laughs> of putting the Pokemons in the parks, all of that, of course, is, cre is created simply through zeros and ones. So what is existence? Well, this brings us to a very essential question because obviously the I Ching was in touch with something very essential. What is existence? Now we only know we exist through sensation. It's through the experience of something that we know we exist. And what is sensation? Sensation is the awareness of contrast. So we only know through contrast. For example, hearing, the nature of sound is compressed and uncompressed. In a way, it's ones and zeros. It's a signal with space. It's a mixture of vibration and stillness. Every harmony, every musical piece, of course, is the, the silence the, the silence is as important as the notes. Here, the compressed air, the, the, which creates a pressure on our ear, is as important as the spaces of uncompressed air between those pulsations. Otherwise, we wouldn't hear anything. A melody without its silent spots wouldn't be a melody. So the only way we can hear, the only way we can sense, the only way we can know that we exist is through zeros and ones, is through the contrast of opposites. So we can reproduce everything in the universe with zero and one, or if you want to say off and on, or black and white, or yin and yang. All of our perceptions, all of our senses, hearing our sight, are just a real vast composite of little yeses and noes. So we know through comparison, we know through the comparison of these um, relative opposites. So we only have relative knowledge. If you ask yourself, what is white? Well, white is white only in comparison to something darker. And then you would compare it to something that you looks white because it's next to black, but if you find something whiter, then you would say, well, that's white and the other one is gray. So we know through comparison, that is the way our brain works. So we're always contrasting things. We're always comparing and measuring. And our brain is always looking at opposites to make those contrasts. Now, what's important to realize, and which we sort of forget because we don't think about how our brain is operating, but what seem to be opposites are really complementary. So what our brain divides into black and white, yes and no, on and off, we classify as being opposites, or polar opposites even. But in reality, there couldn't be, there couldn't, cannot be one without the other. They are completely complementary. Take, for example, the word inside, or the state inside. Well, inside cannot exist unless you have an outside. So inside is only relative to outside, and those two exist together. One cannot exist without the other. So what we see as polar opposites are always complementary. One always goes with the other in order, in order for there to be a reality. So this is the yin-yang symbol, which probably all of you have seen, which represent the dark and the light, which represent the yes and the no, the yin and the yang, that spiral folding onto itself, which, and the, the white with the black dot, meaning that the, po the positive implies the negative and the negative implies the positive. Which one is empty space and which one is thing? They imply each other. And therefore, even though they're explicitly different, they're implicitly the same. There's no such thing as a one-sided mountain. There is always a yang side, the positive sunny south, and a yin side, 
the north is shady. One cannot exist without the other. Another way to think of it is the usefulness of a vessel is not that clay of which it is made, but the empty space inside. The usefulness of a window is the empty space it provides for light to come through. So space, and that's the point I'm making here, is not nothing. Space is what defines something. Space is as important as what appears to be the thing. And this is what we talked about last week. I used the words material and immaterial. Here I'm just using a different vocabulary, but really saying the same thing as I did last week. The immaterial is what defines the material. And the material is defined by the immaterial. The two are two dimensions of reality that are as important one for the other. This is very important when we do homeopathy because, of course, homeopathy, as everyone knows, is nothing. There's no thing in it. It is, it is a signal. It is a, 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 a signature. But it is not a thing in itself. And so it borders between the material and immaterial. So now I want to go to, to the human dilemma and talk about a limitation of how our brain works and how it's limited our perspective and how it gets in the way of us seeing the world holistically. We live in a fragmented world and we experience ourselves as fragmented, basically just because of one single small limitation. If you take a look at this picture, Okay, and I ask you, do you see two bases, the two faces or a vase? Notice how your brain can only see one or the other. It goes back and forth between the vase and the faces, faces, but it can't see both simultaneously. So even though this is one whole and it has those two dimensions of the space and the thing, we can only focus on one at a time. This is another very famous one. You know, is it the young woman or the old woman? We can only see one or the other. We can't see the two of them at the same time. Notice, just watch how your brain goes back and forth between those two images. But it cannot do this, the two of them simultaneously. So uh, I'll, I'll answer questions at the end. Okay. So what, we, what developed out of this is what's called mechanism. In other words, because we see things as fragmented, because we see things either as space or as a thing, because we see in this polarized way, all of research and all of science right now, except in physics, is based on this idea of either or and not both. In other words, everything is seen as a cause and effect and everything is seen as if in a mechanical way, as if one thing affects the other, which affects the other. So we're always asking the question, what causes what? Which came first? When we look at disease, they want to look at the cause, but are they really looking at the cause or are they looking at things that have arisen simultaneously? And that's a very big question that we're going to look at when we look at, at health and disease and homeopathy. But for now, let's just look at this. So what, so what, because of this limitation in our brain, we've developed a whole methodology in science that is very mechanical and based on mechanism. So we're always looking, whether it's biology or chemistry, we're always looking for what mechanism is in operation. In other words, what, is, what makes what happen? As if everything is a machine. And it's very useful when we're making machines. Where it falls apart, of course, is in, with life, especially also in space and other places, but I'll get to that. We have that question, which came first, the bee or the flower? If we're talking about evolution, there couldn't be flowers without bees because they wouldn't be pollinated and therefore the plant wouldn't be able to reproduce. So, Bees are required for there to be flowers, and flowers 
of course, are required for bees to exist and, and proliferate. This is a question that can't be answered by science. You know the chicken and the egg? Yeah. The chicken and the egg can't be answered because our brain wants to make it an either or, wants to make one the cause and the other the, uh, the effect. But what we don't get is the question itself is wrong. Okay? But right now, there's no other way to ask the question in science. That's the limitation, and that's the frustration. It's because we can only think mechanically and cause and effect, then we for formulate our questions in the wrong way. And this is what prohibits us from seeing holistically. So the mechanical model, which of course Newton devised and has been very useful to make machines, breaks down in this new age of Einstein's relativity. So since 1905, Newtonian physics has really been outdated and every, every nuance, every new discovery, everything that has come out of Einstein's relativity and quantum physics since 1905, and that includes everything from lasers, computer science, electronics, uh, the development of, of high-speed electricity, everything is based on the laws of relativity. So gradually, more and more in leading edge science, especially in physics, and especially in the areas touching physics, so biophysics and other areas, quantum biology and quantum physics, everything is seen as an interconnected net, interconnected fields, instead of a chain of billiard balls being bounced around. And this is the picture that I used last week to illustrate the human being as not an object, but really as a dance of waves, as a standing waveform, and um, a dance of intersecting waves. And these waves, of course, are part of fields that go out right into the cosmos, field effects that are interwoven in nature and life and everything on Earth, as well as in the cosmos. So coming back to our bee, which came first, the bee or the flower? Well, holism would say that the bee and the flower are one organism. Just two separate parts, and yes, they can be separated in space, but they are one organism. They rose simultaneously. There is an interdependence between them. They had a mutual arising, and of course that phrase comes from Buddhism. Mutual arising is the foundation of Buddhism, the understanding that everything comes together. Of Taoism too, if we understand that it's, there's a one whole, there's a one movement, there is one thing forming and informing all of reality. That totality, that whole, is the Tao. So holism is what is replacing mechanism. So instead of asking what is the cause and what is the effect and which came first, holism would ask the question, what are the organisms that are formed in nature? And how do those organisms function as a part of that greater whole? What is their relationship to the whole? And how do they sustain the whole? This kind of thinking is going to help us enormously as we look at the problems facing us in ecology. Our ecological crisis is created because of the mechanistic thinking that we have had over the last 300 years. We think mechanically, and we see things as separately, and we see one thing as the cause of the other. We also see ourselves as dominant of nature instead of being an integral part of nature. All of that has to change for humanity to survive and also for the planet to survive. A question that the Taoist would ask is, when do you begin dying? Let's just think about that. When do we begin the dying process? At the moment of birth. Birth and death are intimately entwined. They're the same fabric. We begin dying the moment we're born. And so life and death are one. 
They are not two opposites. One cannot be without the other. So there's a wholeness to life that has to include death. Otherwise, it's not whole. But if you notice, our society does not live the Tao, does not live the wholeness of that idea. We play the constant game of one side must win. <laughs> you know, it's life over death. And if we watch ourselves, if we watch how we go through life, our whole life and all day long, watch how often we want this to happen and not that. Or how often we see things in terms of cause and effect. We see ourselves as being the cause and effect of so much. We struggle when we, because we want things to be this way and not that way. In other words, we struggle with the Tao. We struggle with the wholeness of life and unfortunately live in a polarized duality that that um, feeling of opposites or living in opposites. So it's interesting, you know, white must always win, but of course white can win only if black loses. So maybe we should congratulate black for letting white win. <laughs> but you know, that's the white must always win. You know, that's the, that's the, the main storyline of every thriller of, of every Western, of every detective story, of all the movies and plays, you know, it's like, you know, is, is the black guy going to get away with it? Is the bad guy going to get away with it? Is white going to win? You know, whatever that white or black is, whatever side we associate with, of course, that's what makes the intrigue and the excitement and the disappointment if they don't. So that's a fundamental aspect of the ego when we talk about the i and the sense of self and the ego it is in it's the involvement in this game of white wins my side wins i win in whatever way i have to win over whatever i have to you know and it could be over my garden over but you know that that needing to control the needing to um manage and the needing to uh, foresee all of those things is always wanting one side over the other. And we get worked up about it, we get worried about it, we get angry, excited, exalted, proud, say we have all of our emotions, all about that. So asking ourselves the question, what are you attached to? What am I attached to? And what am I taking so seriously? that I'm so attached to it that it's as if it's life or death, that I get all stressed out about it. Because it's both my passion and my suffering. So whatever we are most attached to is what we're most passionate about, but it's also where we suffer the most. And it's recognizing that our passion and our suffering are one whole, again, they're simply the yin and yang of being alive. And that's when we forget that it's a game and <laughs> we take it much too seriously. <laughs>